be the first of many uh, talks on tech and policy uh, organized by the CSC where I work, so the Civil Service College, uh, with our partner this evening, uh, Open Government Products, and our speaker, Hong Yi, who is director of that unit. Um, uh, I, I think I, we, we, we started this, this, this series to hopefully talk a little bit better about tech and public service, but also to sort of share more openly about the sort of interesting, new, uh, exciting ideas and experimentations that are happening in government on the digital tech front. Um, there are 1,700, 1,700 people who have signed up for today's um, or, or tonight's um, uh, uh, webinar. Uh, and you come from a variety of backgrounds. You have policymakers, people in operational roles, engineers, lawyers, uh, teachers, academics, a lot of people from hospitals for some reason, um, and students. And I think maybe the reason for this is that I think identity is something that 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 really affects something that we all do and are involved with uh, on the internet. Um, uh, I, I don't think Hongi needs a, a lot of in, in, introduction. Uh, you you already saw his bio uh, in the in the EDM that we sent out. Uh, but OGP Open Government Products is a unit in GovTech that builds tech for public good. Basically, uh, it, it sort of solves problems for users. And I think many of you out there will be familiar with a range of its products. Uh, Beeline. Uh, data.gov.sg. If, if you've ever played with as, um, played with the with the data there, there um, form.gov.sg uh, and go.gov.sg, which you all used uh, to sign up for tonight's webinar. Um, but but two 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 little things before we I I, I let Hongi uh, start talking about today's topic, uh, which is SGID. Uh, there is a Q and A function in Zoom uh, if it's at the bottom right of the of the of the of the, of the program. Uh, that's where you can ask the questions and you can also upvote questions. And my colleague Kim Pern is going to be uh, helping me on the back and uh, sort of like uh, 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 taking them off as 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 Tommy and I sort of touch touch on them. And then maybe towards the last twenty minutes or so of this webinar, uh, we'll get to answering some of those questions. In the meantime, we're going to be looking at the questions that many many of you asked over to about around two hundred questions. Um, thanks for helping us uh, crowdsource those. Um, and at the end of this evening's talk, we're going to ask for some feedback. So please do fill out the form. All right, um, without much further ado, I'm going to ask Hongi to sort of start, start us off um, on SGID. Hey, everyone. Uh, OK, let me share my slides. Uh, give me one second. Cool. All right. Uh, can everyone see this? Yep, OK. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Hong. And uh, as Wendy said, I head up the Open Government Products Division. Just to give you guys a bit of background about us, uh, we're a sort of new experimental um, experimental team within the government, which sort of tries to take modern tech development practices and apply them to the public sector. Um, and SGID, and today I'm going to be talking to you about SGID, which is our new experimental um, verified digital identity system. Um, there's a lot of adjectives in those words. So uh, today, uh, we're going to talk about 15 minutes about what all this is, uh, and then we'll go shift over to Q&A and discuss things for like the next hour or so. Um, but yeah, so without further ado, um, this is the problem we're trying to solve. Basically, uh, as you all know, more like there's been a lot, a lot more scams and spam and like just fraud recently, especially as more and more of our lives move online. Um, these are just two articles. In fact, these are 2019. So even before all this COVID stuff happened and, and now in 2020, it's like even more so. It's I, I think like some statistics are like between 20 to 30 times more like e-commerce scams and like digital scams and like things going online um, because it makes sense because as more our lives go online, that's where the scammers are going to go. Um, and the problem is that fundamentally, this is really, really hard to stop. Because even for, a, let's say, even let's say you have a platform, right, who is really dedicated to tra tracking these things down. Um, let's say you have Carousel, for example, and like someone, you know, someone gets scammed on Carousel, they report them, Carousel investigates, they figure out, yep, this is, this is bad, we find, identify the account, we block it. Then what happens is that the, the, whoever the malicious actor is, he just creates a new account and, you know, you're back to square one. And, that, and that's fundamentally the issue, right? Uh, without verified identity, um, blocking bad people from like there can be no consequence to bad behavior online you can scam people you can lie you can cheat you can create multiple accounts you can gain systems and there's not much that platform can do because you can just keep making new accounts so if you had a verified identity system this would solve a lot of that issue because if someone let's say uh like spam carousel with like you know false listings you know you could you can put some penalty on them right you could put a warning on them you could you could have a sort of like a badge like warning about their reputation and if they're particularly bad you can just block them from the platform entirely um and that would be really useful because then these platforms far from everyone you know every, people they, they stop getting flooded with nonsense and people can start trusting each other a lot better um and that would be and that would help 
all the good users of these platforms. And even for the non-malicious actors, having a verified identity can be beneficial because it allows you to have verified information sharing. So for example, you know, let's say you're, 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 you know, you're signing up with a bank or you are you know, going to a gym or something, you can share your like verified like phone number or address or date of birth or whatever, like in a, in a, in a, in a, in a authoritative form. That way the business knows that this is indeed, you know, you are a real person with a real address and a real phone number so that I feel trusted dealing with you as an individual and like giving you, I don't know, uh, perks or subsidies or incentives or whatever the hell it is um, that, that you might need to deal with the business. And so it allows, it, like verified identity allows, like, allows us to deal with the malicious actors better and also allows like normal users to have sort of stronger trust with each other when sharing their information um, if let's say you're, you know, you're shipping a product or something like that. Um, so yeah, so there is obviously, so, so there's obviously a lot of benefit to having a verified digital identity, but there are some very substantial problems with the traditional approach to this. And this here on the right is a, is a very, very dramatically simplified um, sort of diagram about how, about how a traditional uh, sort of central uh, digital identity system works, right? So this could apply to, let's say, SyncPass or Google or Facebook or, you know, Apple ID or whatever. Uh, actually, I know Apple ID does some pretty interesting stuff. So maybe not Apple ID, but like um, you get the point. And, I'm, and you can see here, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so let's say you, you have a server, which is, runs the system, and the server has a, data, has a database which stores all the digital, uh, which stores, you know, information about you, right? So in Google's case, this will be your Gmail, uh, your, G your email address, uh, your real name, let's say your credit card information, if you put that into Google Pay or something like that, and a few other things. Um, and when you, let's say, click the sign in with the Google button, what happens is you as a user go to the server and say, hey, can you send my information to this business? Um, and fairly straightforward, you know, and there you have a digital ID system, right? Uh, yeah, pretty simple, straightforward, but could go wrong with that. Um, but as some of you have noticed, there are a few problems with that. So the first problem is that um, the server, which is the central authority, the, 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 the sort of authority which serves your ID, has full vis visibility into all your actions. So if you sign in with Google on different websites, Google technically knows all the websites you sign into Google with like using Google. And that's, you know, that seems obvious, but that may not be something, a desirable characteristic. And similarly, if you use SingPass, SingPass knows all the places you signed in SingPass with. That's just the nature of SingPass. Um, and so the point, and, and, and you might trust them. Like, you know, I, I trust, I generally trust Google because I have my email on there and I have to, and all, all uh, but I still may not want to share this information. And so uh, first problem, the server has, as a sort of central broker of all this, has visibility into all your transactions as a central ID system. And if this is just for one service, that's okay. But if this starts proliferating, let's say across society, right? It goes across your gym, your hospital, your bank, your, you know, your, your like, like visiting, I don't know, what, what, whatever services you use, whatever, whatever, like, uh, like, like uh, restaurants you go to, um, that could start to be a concern. There is a second problem. Similarly, uh, is that there is a big data source, which is a, which is proliferate, which gets bigger and bigger and more and stores more and more data, the more this is used. So if you have just the Google account, that's fine. You have Google account, Amazon account, they're separate things, separate sets of sources of data. But let's say we succeed, right? Let's say we succeed and we create a national digital identity system and every service in Singapore uses this national digital ID system and it's great. Um, well, you might start off with just your date of birth and then you start adding your educational information, right? Then you start adding your medical information. Then you start adding your banking information. You start adding your employment inf information. You start adding your rewards points, your uh, where you like to shop, where like you know uh, where, where your fam uh, where, where your family where your family lives and goes to school. And like the more and more people come on board, the more and more information are stored in this one giant database, and it becomes one giant target. That if there's any vulnerability or any leak or anything like that, it's very very big and juicy because it contains the whole country's uh, information on everything. Um, and that's not good. So that's problem two. Now, and there's a third problem, which in my opinion is, is probably the biggest one, um, which is that a common ID necessarily means a common privacy failure. So let's say you use your NRIC and you sign into the hospital, you go to the bank, but you also use it to, let's say, I don't know, for, for your McDonald's like loyalty rewards points or something like that. And I'm, I'm not picking on McDonald's here. I'm just like picking them as an example of a, you know, a restaurant that you would know. Um, and let's say, theoretically, uh, McDonald's doesn't have the best cybersecurity. Again, I don't know anything about McDonald's cybersecurity. I'm just saying there's no reason why you would expect fast food chains to have the best cybersecurity. And McDonald's leaks out, uh, has a data breach, right? Well, unfortunately, because 
the, the, the NRIC that you use is the same ID that you use at the hospitals, the same ID you use at the banks and every other place. Now suddenly that data breach means that all your, everyone, every single person who's ever seen your NRIC now knows something about you. So you might just think it's just McDonald's, right? But like, think about it. Um, I can see every single McDonald's restaurant that uh, McDonald's outlet that you've gone to, where it is, what you've ordered, what time of day you go, which means I can infer where you live, where you go to work, how you spend, like how you spend your day um, and what you like to eat, which is kind of scary for something as simple as a fast food reward system. Um, and that's just fast food reward system. You can imagine as this gets to more and more places, let's say we, again, let's say we succeed and we have the whole country use a digital ID system. Then every single point of interaction with that digital ID system because another becomes another vulnerability where you could leak data and everyone else because they use the same ID can see everything about you when that person leaks out that data. And, and, and so it, you know, the bigger and bigger it is, the higher and higher chance there is for an ID for, for a common failure because you're using a common ID. So these are problems. So these are substantial problems which people very legitimately raise when we say we want to have national digital identity systems. So how can we get around this? You know, how can we get around the problem of so uh, a central authority having full visibility, a big, a big juicy hacking target, and a very huge sort of privacy vulnerability um, from everyone using a common ID. So that's what SGID is for. Yeah, basically, how can we have safe online transactions because we want a verified ID while having user privacy be protected? And that's how we use SGID. So just to clarify, SGID is an experimental a uh, new system and app that we're that we're building. It's meant to work. Uh, it's meant to sort of be uh, an extension to SingPass. Um, we are we are we have a standalone app right now that's just used for testing and demo purposes. And then we're working on getting our code uh, into like integrating with SingPass and augmenting some of the uh, some some of the systems to work this way. So um, this is talk again. This is experimental. We are we are we have tested this in some small cases, but it's not generally available yet. But you can download the app and, and try it out if you like. Um, so what is SGID? Well, first, basically, it's an app on your phone. And when you sign on to SGID, instead of having a big server in the cloud which stores all your data, SGID pulls data from different places onto your device. So there is obviously your official government information, which is right now in my info. Um, but you can imagine pulling your banking information, your transport information, your healthcare information, and pulling them not from, and not having them all centralized in one big target in the cloud, but having them your information on your device so it's within your control. This is a, this one big advantage of this, as we talked about earlier, is you no longer have one big server database that someone can leak the credentials to and the whole country is compromised. You now have a whole, like every single device has, and every single person has their own little pocket of information that they have power, that they have control over to keep safe. Um, next, because all this information is on your device, you control who you share the information with. So one of the problems with, soft, I guess, these traditional uh, cloud-based service ID, ID systems is that, you know, there is some secret handshake between the government and the bank to share this information, or there's some secret handshake between um, the schools and uh, your employer to share this information. And you really don't know what it is. And with SGID, because everything comes to you and your device first, and it's pulled to your phone, you can control when someone requests information from you, you see what they're requesting and what you're sharing with them, and you have a record of what you're shared with who. And this is, again, putting the user in the center, giving them control over what uh, about, the, about their personal data. Third, SGID is end-to-end -end encrypted. Basically all transactions in SGID so are end-to-end -end encrypted so that only you and the business can see the transaction and see what information is being shared. So this is sort of like WhatsApp. So, you know, if, if, I, if I sign on to WhatsApp and I send someone a message, the WhatsApp servers, the people who work at WhatsApp can't see that message because they're end-to-end -end encrypted. And that way, even though you're using WhatsApp, you know, uh, you can trust that on, like only you and the person you're sending a message to get that information. And that's what we're trying to do with SGID. We're not using the exact same protocol, um, but the same idea applies, which is that the business and you will, will know that this transaction happens, but the government providing this service is just a, is just a, is just a dumb messenger. We just, we just pass the encrypted message back and forth and we don't know who you're sharing it with, uh, or like we don't know whom is interacting with whom and what information they're sharing. Um, and finally, I think this is one of the coolest features of SGID which I really like is we generate a consistent but unique identity per, per business you interact with. So this, this is a little bit complicated, so let me explain. So let's say I go to a hospital, right? So let's say my NRIC is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, A, and I go to the hospital. And I, I go to the hospital and uh, instead of sharing my NRIC with them, what happens is you get, the hospital gets an SGID. It gets a consistent business ID in this case, which is 
K4FJ SB429. And every time I go to the hospital, they will see the same ID. You know, that way you can follow appointments, you can check your medical records, all that sort of thing. But when I go to McDonald's, I will have a different ID entirely. So 39NFK S88. This is an entirely separate, separate and new identity. This is really, this is really important because what this means is that firstly, every single business, while they still have the verified, so they can still treat it as a verified ID, they can still block people from the platform, they can still have accountability and all that good stuff. But if let's say, if let's say McDonald's has a data leak, right? Let's say, let's, let's say they, they leak out the records. Well, it's no big deal because all people will see is that someone whose, whose ID is 39NFK S88 went to McDonald's. This has nothing to do with my NRIC. It is not correlatable to my, to my hospital records or my bank records or anything like that. In fact, who cares? Uh, and because if a random small business leaks their business information, it shouldn't affect people's visibility of me in my, uh, just because they've seen my medical records or because they've seen my banking records or anything like that. Um, so you have a consistent but unique ID per business uh, with SGID. So all this has a few benefits, right? We've got the verified identity, which we originally set out the benefits for. It allows third-party verified data with a robust distributed data storage model, which is better than this sort of like centralized single source of failure. You as a user have central control of your data sharing. And finally, you have privacy from the government, from other from businesses, and protection from data leaks. So these are some of the key benefits we have for SGID. Um, so I've talked, gone over this at sort of the high level. Um, this next section is how does all this work, right? And so I, I know we have quite a few sort of engineering, engineering people in the audience, so I'm gonna go over this. Um, this are, these are very nice promises, but obviously it, it means nothing if they are, can't deliver, right? So this is not some like blockchain uh, voodoo uh, mumbo jumbo, like this is, I'm gonna explain, um, this is a, a simplified, this is a dramatically simplified version of the protocol, but it still is a little bit like, it still could be a little bit hairy. So uh, do bear with me and feel free to ask any questions if any of this is unclear. Okay, so first is the structure. Uh, for SGID, there are two main part, parts. There's the registration server and the transaction server. And then the user has an app on their phone. So there are, there are two servers and then one app on your phone. The first, start, the first step is when a user signs up, when he registers for SGID. When he registers for SGID, he goes through the registration server. And this is just the onboarding process. As he registers, he pulls all his data from, his data, from the data source onto the registration server. The registration server signs all this data uh, with a, does a digital signature for all, these, uh, for, 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 all the, for all this data and then hands it off to the user and then we delete it from the server. So we never see it ever again. Like this is just official information that you pull onto your device. Um, it gets registered and then the registration for server never sees it again. It's digitally signed so that when you share this with other people in the future, they can, they can verify that this official information and not just random information that you're making up. What we then do is that we generate, as you can see here, a proxy ID uh, between the registration server and the transaction server. So the proxy ID is essentially how we how the transaction server maintains anonymity for the user, where the transaction server never sees your actual NRC, never sees your actual name. All the proxy ID is is just it's just an anonymous random number so that you can interact with the transaction server without ever actually seeing who you are. The registration server pulls all your information and after that you're done. And then it gets a proxy ID and then it passes over proxy ID to the transaction server. Next, when we share data to a business. So what happens is, let's say the, the business requests for some data, right? I showed you the, I showed you the, the screenshot earlier. Um, here, you will get a request saying, you know, whoever is asking for, let's say, let's say, let's say my, my team is asking to share your information, asking for information. You see the request and you click agree. All right, so what, does ha what happens after that? What happens is, First, we encrypt all the data that you're going to share with the business's public key. So this is a this is this is this is it means it's encrypted in such a way that only the business requesting the data can read it, and no one else, including the transaction server, including SGID, can read it. No one else. It's encrypted. We hand this encrypted payload then to the server. So the server has the encrypted payload but cannot access it because it's encrypted with the business's key, but not but not the server's. But instead of but instead of uh, just you know, handing this through to the business, what we do is we take the prox the, the, trans the transaction server takes the proxy ID that we, that we had earlier, the business's specific ID for the specific business, and then we smash them together to form the SGID, which is a unique ID for that business, for that person. 
This allows, and then we hand that down to the business. The business then can take, can because the business has its own private key, can then decrypt the payload of the data and access whatever information you shared with them. While, and, but because the information came from the server, they can verify that this was official information. So few benefits of this. So let's go over this. Uh, one, the transaction server does not store any user data. It doesn't save anything. It doesn't store any user information. Um, it has, all it has is just, it just knows that random encryption, encrypted messages are going between some user and, and, and a business, but I don't know who the user is because I never see the user's actual ID. It can never view the encrypted payload because it's encrypted with a business's private key and not, the, and not SGIDs. And if I have more shareable data, more and more shareable data going into SGID, the database is no bigger because it's all stored on user devices. The users control what data they're sharing and it doesn't grow and you don't have a larger and larger attack surface. From the business's perspective, you can verify the authenticity of the data because one, you can decrypt it to make sure that yes, only you can see it. You can use the public key that the transaction server handed to you to make sure that the data that the user encrypted over sent, to, sent over encrypted is indeed his data and he's not sending some other random person's data over. And because it comes via the transaction server with this SGID, you know that this person is the person he says he is. Essentially, the transaction server vouches for this guy and say, yep, this is, this is a person. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you exactly who he is, but this is the same person and he has a, a valid SGID account. Um, and that's how you get sort of verified identity while you have anonymity. It seems a bit counterintuitive, but this is how we achieve verified identity while having anonymity. So yeah, that's, uh, that's SGID. Um, so I, I, I know that might have been a bit technical and I apologize, I must have gone over a little bit. Uh, but yeah, do feel free to ask any questions and uh, we can, I, I'm happy to see what I can do. Sweet, thanks Hong, that was, that was really super. Uh, we actually have a lot of questions in the, in the, the, the Q&A, and those tend to sort of fall into the, the question that people asked um, immediately. So I guess, I guess we'll, 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 um, we'll take them in turn. Um, but one of the things that I like about SGRD, at least from a non-technical person, I've only dabbled in programming, I don't have very much technical background at all, is this idea that, 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 that people can control what we share uh, with, with with other entities right and you might be familiar for example with the, with the controversy that's going on on uh, on a reddit right now um about lumi health requesting a whole bunch of data from people right um uh it, it was interesting to me that they're asking not only for my name and my gender but also my employment history my children's birthdays and so on and so forth um and at least on a social level when we think about our identities um the people that we are at home are not the people that we are at work right so we share we share certain attributes of ourselves at work and certain attributes of ourselves with friends and others at home and it seems to me that giving people the choice about what they want to share with different entities on the internet i guess better closely approximates uh, the social realities of identity right is that we actually control a lot about what we share about ourselves um, with other people, um, I guess the one uh, the one question I, I I have about this though is that it and I, and I, and, I, and, I, and I like that it raises um, our our at least ra raises questions about this about, about this issue is do, doesn't this actually prevent organizations from doing data analytics on people or acquiring data insights because they don't have these huge databases anymore and is that a challenge that you're going to be running into when you try and sell this product to the government or or like banks or, or other entities right. um so to be clear that, that uh you can still do all the analytics you want on your own data Right. So if you're McDonald's, you can, like your customer has a unique ID. He comes to you. If the same customer comes to you across different days, uh, across different places, he's the same ID. So he's the same customer to you. And you can do all the analytics you can normally do. You just can't match that. You can't just go buy, but, but then you can't go buy some, let's say, um, I don't know, transportation data and then match it with that. Because mm -hmm. by design, by design, we want, to de what, we want to decouple those two areas. So all, agencies can still do all the analytics they want over their own customers, which is as it should be. And they can't, match it across domains, which it shouldn't be. Um, yeah. Well, so perfect. Um, the other thing I like about this is that it actually moves away from this age old idea that we have these permanent ID numbers uh, that were usually written on like physical cars that accompany us through life, right? Like, the, and, and I, I like that we are, we are using the, the possibility of digital technology here to generate a unique ID for every transaction. Um, 
But that raises the question, right, of this other movement in digital identity that we're also seeing here in Singapore, which is moving towards biometric ID, like facial verification or using our iris scanners, right? Um, and in this case, like if, if, if our IC numbers are unchangeable and therefore vulnerable, uh, surely our biometric data is even more vulnerable because it's unchangeable, right? So I'm wondering about your personal thoughts about whether or not national digital identity systems should be using biometric data given the vulnerabilities. Straight no, uh, we shouldn't be using biometric data. Um, biometric <laughs> data is, it's, it's sort of like a four-digit passcode. It stops people from just like picking up your phone and like, you know, just using it as a sort of opportunistic drive by attack. Right. But like, in a, for, a, for, a, for a sophisticated attacker, biometric data it does nothing. Like you can imagine that it, like, especially with all the sort of deep fake stuff now, you can see like if I wanted to make a fake video of someone, let's say a public, let's say a prominent public leader, turns out there's like hundreds of hours of video of him that I can just fake a profile on and like have the camera read that in and ta-da, yes. your, your facial recognition. Yes. Um, my, yeah, like, and uh, my, my, my general sense, and I could be, again, my, I could be wrong about this, but my general sense from reading is that within the soft security community, biometrics and biometrics are usernames they are not passwords that's the way you should think about them um right yeah uh and okay. which means that it's again useful for very casual for very casual like really i like you know just put it on my phone so that my my, my, my nephew can't pick it up or something like that right uh, but not as a but not as a core part of your of your, of your authentication system okay uh and as ID does not include biometric data in any of its of its users so, it could use biometric data. So for example, um, let's say if you wanted to store your biometric data in SGID and share that with someone, you could. If you wanted, oh, okay. to, if you wanted to, let's, uh, 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 for, let's say you have this on your, on your iPhone, right? right. Um, and you wanted to, um, I don't know, like just have, the, have your touch ID to authenticate into SGID, you could. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, again, fair for a sort of like drive by attack so that some random person, like let's say you're showing your friend a photo on your phone, they can't access everything to, like that. But right. um, it, is not, it is not a fundamental part of how we do, uh, how we do our authentication. Perfect. Yeah. Right. What I think I like, I like about it though, is that it sort of stores data or uses our phones rather than stores data on a, on a, on a server somewhere. And at least, at least with, um, you know, like, like fingerprint ID or a facial ID on our phones, that data is also stored on our phones, right? It's not stored on a, on a single server that is, that is likable to be hacked, or maybe there's a leak, or maybe some disgruntled employee decides to like, export and exfiltrate the data, exactly. like, we, like we've seen before, right? But I guess, so there's actually a couple of questions in the Q&A here as well, and something that was asked uh, in, in, in people's registration uh, questions, um, which is, doesn't that actually create a security risk then? Because people have to then keep their phones like really secure, like do you, so A, I guess the question was, do you think people would keep their phones that secure? And B, what happens if you lose your phone? Yeah, um, so the answer to the first one is yes, they should, they need to, but you have to do so anyway. Um, let's put it this way, like, so the, the attack that SGID is vulnerable to is if someone manages to compromise all iPhones and all Android devices. Right. Um, but if you think about it, if someone manages to compromise all iPhones and all Android devices, whether or not you're using SGID, I have access to all your stuff anyway. If I manage to compromise your iPhone, like all iPhones, then whatever you log into on your iPhone, whether it's via SGID, whether it's via Google, whether it's via Facebook or whatever, I've got access to it anyway. Like I've got device, um, I've got device access. You're, you're basically done. So uh, yes, that is true, but everything is vulnerable to that attack. Uh, and right. so it's not true to say that, it is not true to say that um, uh, if, you, if, the, if the data is stored on the server, let, let's put it this way, for the current SingPass iteration, yes, the data stored on the server, but if I have access to your phone, if I have managed to compromise your phone, the next time you open SingPass app and you view it on your phone, I have access to the data. I don't need to compromise SingPass servers. It, you, you're accessing SingPass server through your phone, and so you've compromised it. So um, yeah, it, it, that is a remaining vulnerability, but basically, basically we've reduced the risk to just that uh, rather than having that plus the server compromise. Um, the second bit, which is what they lose your phone, it's like, well, same thing you do elsewhere, like hope that you locked it, do a remote wipe on it if possible. Um, like it, your, right. phone, your phone has access to all kinds of stuff. And so, yeah, take care of it carefully. And if you lose it, make sure it's locked and do a remote wipe. And then when you start up a new phone, um, just reinstall SGID, sign in again. Right. Um, and re-pull and re-download your data. Right. And that's the question with 48 volts. Is, and that happens also if you like change your device, that, that, that will be yeah. the same process. So, this is the same protocol as WhatsApp, by the way. So yeah. you, we all have WhatsApp on our phones and WhatsApp yeah. has the same thing where the messages are just stored on your phone. And if you yeah. switch to a new phone, you, you need to either move, migrate the messages manually 
yeah. or uh, not, and you just have to keep your phone safe and delete it if, if you lose it. Yeah. Uh, actually, so actually, the other question that's really popular, and you, since you just mentioned SingPass, is how do you foresee this coexisting with SingPass since SingPass already con uh, contains and collects all our information? Right. So uh, as I described earlier, I, I think Pass has a role. It is, I mean, it is sort of like that that approach of like how we implemented it in the in a traditional manner of a digital ID system. Um, but I, but this is a this is a sort of supplement to that, right? This is this yeah. is we are working with the SyncPass team to work SGID protocols into SyncPass and like augment yeah. it so that it starts working this way. Um, now, as as anyone who's worked in software knows, like how you do sort of system migration is a sort of like very complicated bureaucratic process, doing all kinds of things here and there. Uh, but the basic idea is that this is where we want to get to. So uh, we are getting to a place where we are putting this into SyncPass, and we are like we are integrating into the SyncPass app, so users don't have to download a, a new app or a new device. Um, and then we are sort of testing. We, are, we are, again, this is experimental, so we're going to test this out with a couple of use cases and see how well it goes. And if it works well, then we'll open up to more and more, and you know, go from there. Okay. Um, but yeah, it should work mostly. It should work mostly transparently to users. Like for all this talk about how it works and downloads it, when I say all this, it happens automatically. So as a user, you install the app. You install, let's say, the SyncPass app. You mm -hmm. register, which instead of just registering, just downloads the information. And then when you choose to share, you'll have a prompt which which just asks you, you want to share. It works. I would say 90% transparently to users, and you wouldn't have to care about it. The only time you care about it is when we prompt you to to confirm that you want to share the data rather than just sharing it. And that I think is a positive. Right. Someone asks, can a person choose to unshare data? I mean, I mean, you can't unshare information. Um, unfortunately, it's just shared <laughs> uh, like you sent it. Like you, you, there's no ongoing connection. Let's put it this way. So there is no ongoing connection between them that he can't. He doesn't have like you know lifetime access to your account. But you have yeah. sent him a message with your information, and yeah. you send it to him. Like I mean, you can ask him politely to delete it. But like um, there is, but there is no ongoing connection. So. In what, but in one respect, all data is automatically unshared after transmission, and in another respect, it's you know you can't undo, uh, you can't unspeak a uh, unspeak a word. This is true. Hence the hence the the, the tension in in, in in at least in tech, right? The information wants to be free, but it's also valuable. Um, so uh, Christopher Gee, who's from IPS, says, how much of the SGID code will be open access so that people can ascertain that it does have the protections and the controls that you say it has, and having an independent review of the system which really boosts people's acceptance of the system. So from my perspective, I, I'm a very strong believer in open sourcing code. Um, yeah. I, I think, especially if something needs to be accepted by the public and a whole bunch of security use cases, I don't believe in security through obscurity. Um, and so we will, I, I will try to open source as much as possible. And I talk about the protocol fairly openly um, and audit it. Um, that being said, I unfortunately am not the chief cybersecurity officer of the whole government. <laughs> so, uh, that will be a decision for people you know, in higher pay grades than me to decide. Okay. Um... So there's one of the questions about the using of smartphones, and that has to do with accessibility issues, right? So how is SGB ID going to work uh, for, let's say, for example, the elderly who don't have smartphones, and is it going to be accessible, for example, with disabled users? Um, yeah, sure. Okay, so the disabled users part is uh, is probably the easiest one to answer. Like, yeah. um, iOS, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you tried it. iOS for, let's say, the visually impaired is one of the best, weird is weird. Mm -hmm. To think about, but like iOS, even though it's a full touch screen and a big display, is actually one of the best uh, devices for the visually impaired because it has a built-in, like sort of, like scanning model where people can you can you, you should try it out if you haven't. Um, but basically, you sort of like pan your finger across the screen and and the uh, and the operating system like reads out what that your fingers under and tells you what you're doing. Um, and you know it, it works fairly well, like uh, apparently. Um, Engineering for people with different disabilities is non-trivial, uh, and and we do try to do it the best as we can. Um, but yeah, iOS and Android actually have this built in fairly well nowadays, and we leave those to the, yeah. we leave that to the the, the sort of like accessibility experts. Yeah. Um, the other question was for the elderly who don't have smartphones. Um, it's true, like if you don't have a smartphone, it's very hard to be part of like digital identity system. So there's always going to be need for some kind of back operation. Um, I personally like. So I, I think that for, given that that's the scenario, you're, you're probably going to need something like, you know, you, 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 you need a, a trustee to do so, or you can go down to a community center and, and have some, one of the CC staff help you out or something like that. Um, there's a bunch of ways to sort of onboard people to digital systems uh, if they're not too digitally savvy. And like, you know, we, we, do, we do participate in this. We do try to go and like, we do user studies with all pe people from all different backgrounds. Uh, so we don't, you know, one of the easy mistakes to make is assume that everyone has the latest, like, has the latest iPhone and is using that. And, but we do yeah. test across the spectrum, right? We test uh, new phones, old phones, people from like different households. We test like different languages. So 
obviously English speaking is how a lot of code is written, but like we, you're well aware in Singapore that there are Malay speaking, Chinese speaking, Tamil speaking, like like people from different households, and uh, and we, we do testing and we use that. We do so for several our apps already, so it it's it's yeah. it is a challenging problem, but not insurmountable. I'm actually really curious, and this doesn't actually have to do with specifically with SGID, but I was wondering if OGP or the, the, in the, in the team that you lead, do you have accessibility guidelines that shape all of your products or is this on a case by case basis? Um, we don't have like strictly written guidelines that we wrote ourselves. We try to follow the guidelines that other people have written. And so like Google and like uh, Airbnb and whoever that, who, ha who, are who have very, very thorough, robust design systems. We look yep. at what they do and we try our best to replicate it. Yeah. Um, and then we are very conscious for certain apps, uh, for example, uh, like like one of the things that we built was a sort of like the quarantine uh, the quarantine uh, tracking app that we that we have for all the products, right? So if you're on quarantine order, you have an app that you install, and like you know basically you stay at home and it just reports that you're at home, and you you know you you answer a survey once in a while and take a picture of yourself just to just to sort of verify that. Um, we realized that a lot of people are Chinese speaking, and so we needed mm. to put in we needed to put in that as well as like as well as uh, for different languages and stuff. And so uh, we built in support for that. Um, we it depends a lot on the scenario, um, like usability. There's a very wide range of usability, and so we try our best to like anticipate. Uh, but but what you end up doing is you do the sort of like obvious simple stuff, and then when pe and then as the new sort of problems come up during your testing, uh, you then handle those the best you can. Right. Yeah. Sense. Okay. So uh, the question up here um, with 12 books, SGID is philosophically very different from Singpass. May I know which countries adopt authentication that are more like SGID? So I guess more broadly, right? how, how did you come, come to the idea of SGID and of designing the system the way it is? So uh, SGID is something that we came up with. Um, we didn't, like, I don't know of any other country who's doing something like this yet. There might be. Um, but we were, like, I was looking at this from a sort of privacy perspective and, you know, like, there's a lot of nonsense in the crypto space, but like one of the things that they do come up with fairly well are like sort of privacy protocols and stuff like that. And so I, this is not any particular protocol, but just sort of from reading, from reading a whole bunch of stuff about how the different crypto systems work um, and how the different authentication systems work, like we thought this would be something that we could do. Um, and so we've gone through a few iterations of this. So this is not our first, uh, we've gone through, I think like four versions of the protocol, um, like between the team and like, you know, testing it back and forth. And we've discussed this with various people uh, to get ideas. Uh, but yeah, as far as I know, I don't think any other country has done something like this. And that's why this is experimental. It's, it's not a common standard. It's nothing. We've tried our best. Um, the, it is interoperable, as far as I can tell, like, with OpenID Connect and OAuth, more or less. It's got a few sort of extensions to it, um, but it is more or less interoperable with OpenID Connect and OAuth. Uh, but, the, but the whole sort of like proxy ID plus like generate the unique ID thing, I think that's something that I would say unique, but is fairly specific to us. So there, are, there aren't any other countries using an SGID like um, like thing, but there is OpenID, which is sort of an open source protocol. And at least from 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 how you describe it, and correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe I, correct me if I'm wrong, or if I if I, if I uh, explain this explain this incorrectly, it basically allows a business or another entity to verify me by using another identity provider. In the case of SGID, this would be the Singapore government, right? Is that how it works? Yeah. Right, um, and in that case, it's a bit, it's a bit, it, isn't it a bit like how we use Google and Facebook to log onto third-party sites? It's not like the third-party sites are, are actually handling the passwords and the user IDs. We're actually trusting the good old engineers at Google and Facebook to do the, sec the security and authenticating for us. You're absolutely right. Um, yeah. yeah, and so, so one, uh, I, uh, so we could do that with SingPass. I don't believe we do so now. We might, but I don't believe we do so now. I like don't quote me on that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so right now, when you send third, third, third party sites, you still sign a sync pass rather than through a rather than through an OAuth based system. Yeah. Um, open ID, uh, yeah. but one of the problems with that is still that let's say you do sign in with Google, they still do get your actual Gmail address because they have to, right? They have to get a proper ID for you. Yeah. Um, and Google still has sees who you're signing to Google with. Uh, so this is an extension to that. Um, right. That yeah yeah. Um, the protocol is just that layer of the protocol. It doesn't define the sort of inner working. So we try to we, we're trying to maintain that sort of commonality of that layer of the protocol while changing the inner workings to get these additional features that we want. Um, yeah. Right. Excellent. So I I I know that your team is a big believer in using open source technologies. You know, if you look at any of your apps, usually if you look at the the, the acknowledgements, there are all sorts of of, of acknowledges and uh, acknowledgements of other people's licenses and, and code. Um, as, as someone who's worked in government technology for, for um, some time now, um, 
are you, are you a believer in open source and in using open source in government? And what are the, the opportunities and the drawbacks of doing so? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, a, I'm a very strong believer in open source code. I, I very strongly believe that the only reason tech has moved as quickly as it does is because of open source. And I think for what, like once you start working, like people, like for people outside of who aren't engineers, you think of open source as this weird, like oh, edge thing where there's enterprise software and there's these open source hippie sorts who do these like, you know, public sharing things. But when you actually start working in tech, you realize that everything, everything, even like massive billion dollar companies are anchored on like open source projects. Right. Like, and they just are. And the reason why people can move so quickly is because the open source, is because you use open source code. Um, because programming languages are still not that different. I mean, they've made some progress, but they're still fundamentally, they're not that much more powerful than they were like 15 years ago. Um, but like the libraries and the things that you do, like the reason you can set up TensorFlow just like just like that is huge. Um, so yeah, I, I would say very, very strong believe in open source code. Um, like it is not it is not a panacea. There are a lot of crappy open source libraries. Something being open source doesn't automatically make it good. But what it does do, it, is allow, it allows good libraries which are very well, vest, uh, very, very well security vetted and tested and robust to be accessible. So it is not that open source makes things good, it's that it allows good things to become accessible. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think we should, we definitely need to use it. Like, I, I, I cannot see how you would possibly have a modern digital agency without using open source code. It's just like, it's sort of like trying to bake without using fire or anything else. Like, yeah, technically possible, but you really limit a lot of the stuff you do. Um, and it, and uh, and contributing back to it, I think, is something that we definitely should do. Um, it, uh, it's just part of the ecosystem. No, no, that's absolutely true. I mean, as, as, as someone who's a baby programmer, as, as you know, as I started programming like two years ago, I mean, I, I don't think I would have learned as fast or been able to build even very simple applications without using work that other people already already done. I guess just to give us a sense, though, like once you had decided to use OpenID's pr protocol, how quickly did you build SGID and how, how like, yeah. Uh, so open ID, I mean, there are some, um, how would you describe it? So there are some uh, like parts of their code, like there are some bits of code and stuff that are open source, but, op but open ID connect and OAuth, again, as far as I understand this and I'm not, 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 not professing to be an expert on this, yeah. um, is that it is a protocol and a, and it's sort of like, it is specification more than it is a set of code. So they will, they, they will release the protocol and you write your code to meet that protocol and they have some tools and stuff for you to test it and things like that. But it's not like you, you bootstrap. So there are some things that we do use. There are some like, you know, we use React, for example, uh, right. a React Native to make apps and things like that. Um, but OpenID Connect itself, as far as I understand, is mostly a specification that we build towards rather than like something that we take out of the box and right. stuff. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted you to explain to, better to maybe to a non-technical audience, and you touched on this when you're talking to the engineers portion of your presentation, um, but this idea of zero knowledge or zero trust, um, my sense is that it works very differently from the way that we would conventionally think about security. So this would be the idea that we have a fence around something we want to protect, and as long as you pass the credential and you in, and then once you're in, you can do whatever you want. But the problem with that approach to security is that if someone gets the keys illicitly, uh, in this case, like hack their way through, then that's a problem, right? So I'm, I'm just wondering if you could explain zero knowledge and how that would change our, the way we think about how we secure yeah. systems. Um, basically, it's sort of like similar to your, like your Lumi Health, like the Lumi Health thing that you brought up, right? Which is like, right. why the hell does this guy need to know this about me, right? Um, like why? And, and traditionally, no one really asked that because we didn't really think that hard about digital identity and privacy and stuff in like the decades gone by. And so we just like shared information because like whatever, you know, there's that. Um, but the more that you think about it, the more they're like, well, look, I, I really don't have to share all this with you. Actually, you only need to know. And the more you think about it, when you, a lot of what you think of as traditional um, sort of like web services, you realize even the data itself doesn't need to be shared with the service. So let's say you do WhatsApp, right? Like you would previously think that, yes, obviously if you're running a chat service, the chat people running a chat service can see all your messages, duh. But actually, it turns out that's not true. You can run a chat service, which is end-to-end -end encrypted. And that's actually yeah. good for privacy. And, it, and it's not just good for privacy. Um, from a purely like selfish perspective, from my personal perspective, if I have access to people's private information, then suddenly I have all these security requirements and audits and like risks and like things that I have to... I don't want to deal with that. Like, I just don't, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough energy. I don't want to have to fuss with it. If I can just make it such that I can't see it, then I can't, it can't be like, um, and it can't be, then, then it can't be a problem. And that's good because it means that you get access to the service and it 
again, counterintuitive, but you can, and it, you know, in the, 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 if, if there's anything the last couple of years of like crypto, uh, crypto, cryptocurrency has been good for, it has been figuring out that actually you can make a lot of services very private, uh, a lot more than you think. Uh, and this assumption that the service provider needs to be able to see your see 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 your data to provide the service is just not like it's not true in a lot of cases. It's true in some right. cases, but not all, but not a lot of them. And the more we minimize that, the more we minimize the the sort of attack surface. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question. We have uh, we have two, actually two questions that have to do with uh, linking SGID to to the NRIC, right? Um, so one, one person asks, will the implementation of a proxy ID cause issues with traceability when criminal transactions take place? Um, so in other words, this person is saying that it can't be linked back. On the other, on the other hand, um, can't the unique consistent IDs be traced back to, to, to NRICs? Right? I guess, and I guess this has something to do with, uh, I guess, as, and as we've seen recently, a widespread concern, right? That the reuse of randomized IDs, especially when they're linked to NRIC, at least because they're traced together, might allow people to peer into the data. And then even though they're random IDs, allow them to link somehow Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so this is uh, this is this is a really interesting problem. Yeah. You want to create privacy while still having accountability in the cases where you want accountability. So how do you? Right. Do it? Um, and the way we thought about this, that there are three parties. There's the there is the business, there is the there is the user, and then there is the government. And we want to make it such that only if people agree, like only if two of the three agree to do this, you can get the access to it. But one of the three cannot. Cannot. And so um, the way. Uh, so I, 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 I can't remember the details off the top of my head right now, but basically you design a protocol in such a way, uh, and we like mucked around with some various approaches to this, where as a government, I can't see who you are. As a business, I can't see who you are. But let's say a criminal transaction takes place, business is reporting, it wants to investigate, the business shares their perspective, meaning they share the encrypted information together with the signature and the business ID with the government, and then they combine those two, th two things together. And then we also split the government into two pieces. We split it into the registrator who has to see your stuff just to onboard you and the transaction server. But you know, you're, you're, you're sort of taking advantage of bureaucratic inefficiency in order to achieve some degree of security where, yes, uh, what you're doing is you're making it hard for to re-identify the person, but possible if the registration server, the transaction server and the business are willing to share their data and then trace the guy back. So right. it is technically possible in, uh, in, in, in sort of like security or like criminal scenarios where you really need to, but on an average day-to-day -day basis, like unless like, you know, again, you can put in, you can put in a bureaucracy around this in order, in order, to, in order to limit like who's allowed to share data with what. Right. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, no individual one of them can do any of this. So um, that is the sort of like magic handshake key thing that, that we're doing to, in order to both uh, make it, uh, disconnected from NRICs while making it traceable in the scenario that you do have someone, let's say, uh, right. commit a crime. Um, yes. Can I just say, I love how this discussion is showing us that 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 technology can shape the possibilities and impossibilities of deep governance and ethical questions, um, yeah. right? But okay, so there's, we have, so just to flip this question around, somebody asked what happens if SGID is compromised? Um, and that links to a question uh, that somebody asked um, when 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 they registered, and the, and the person asked, "quote If a hostile nation does a military takeover of Singapore, is there a self-destruct system that can be activated to prevent our SGID details from falling into their hands?" <laughs> well, okay, so uh, yeah, so, so so the point of compromise. Yep, every right. system has compromises, and there are a few of them, and there are ways you can mitigate against it. Uh, and there are things that you can prevent and the things that you can make obvious and detectable, even if you can't prevent. And then there's the stuff which you're like, okay, well, that's just hopefully too hard. Um, so things that we've compromised. Uh, so the hopefully by making our server zero knowledge, even if someone like compromises our transaction servers, they do nothing, hopefully. Um, like because all like, you know, the only thing that the app sends to transaction servers is encrypted data. So yeah, they can like screw around a little bit and they can send messages and cause it to fail, but they can't see your data. So that's that's one compromise factor. Um, another compromise factor we thought about was like on the onboarding process. Like on the onboarding process, uh, how do we make sure that a person onboards the correct data? And like I think I have these in my slide somewhere. Hold on, let me see if I can find this. Oh, you can share them, yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, let me share this again. Uh, yeah. For the onboarding process, I have this in the annex. Um, here we go. Uh, yeah. So rather than just like sending over your blob of stuff which someone can intercept, um, what we do is we make we uh, we send or we, we we use the Apple or Google notification system so that we make sure that we only trigger like 
we trigger, uh, we send it directly to your installation of the app on your device. And so someone can't just like go to a random endpoint, pretend to be you and like grab your information, you know, signing in on your behalf. Uh, or, or let's say if someone convinces you to install a spoof app, uh, let's say, you know, let's say you go, someone goes to some, uh, some, 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 some uh, let's say elderly person and like convinces them to install this whatever app, sign in, and then it snags our data. It's like, mm. you can't do that. Like it sends it like, on, we only send our information down to the specific app ID with our like that sign from the app. So also this is the case again where the bureaucratic component helps uh, helps address the helps address the the technical limitation, which is you know only our, our registered app ID can receive our data via the notification system. Um, so that's why that's one um, other vulnerabilities. Let me think. Um, there is a there is a vulnerability possibly that uh, that the SGID team goes rogue and then like we implement a, a compromised uh, a compromised um, how would you put it? A compromised app on the App Store, um, which directly you could. Um, the question is, uh, the SGID team goes rogue and does that. How would you detect it? Well, you could. Uh, you could look at the encrypted payloads going out. Um, the, the transaction servers will be able to see whether or not it's happening. Ideally, you open source and allow people to verify, and like you could put in the sign, like you you have the digital signatures and things like that to make sure they're getting the stuff from a real, from real source. Um, you theoretically. You theoretically could compile it yourself, but then that would circumvent the first protection. So if you want to compile the app yourself and you're not an official SGID person, then okay, but proceed at your own risk because then you're downloading data to a that you have you'll have to download data to a non-digitally signed app. So that's another compromise. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a like we thought through a few scenarios. Like it is like you know the like as you said, right? If a foreign government comes in here with <laughs> shoots everyone or like holds us a gunpoint they're like oh yeah true i mean at that point the whole system's dead but like your data privacy is honestly the least of your concerns um right. self-destruct in this case i mean it's on people's individual devices if you want to in, if you want to wipe your phone at any point just just wipe it like, you, you right. know, that, like there's already a button there uh to, to reset to hard reset your phone so uh, we don't need to implement anything special you can reset your own data whenever you want and because we don't store it on our own data servers it's just pulled directly from the source so as long as the service provider and you just destroy your data it doesn't exist anymore well, if anything, the, the at least at least in public policy schools, the 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 traditional warning story to be told against governments amassing huge numbers of data about their citizens is, of course, uh, the civil registers that existed in Europe about who was Jewish and who was not, which was provided rich information to, to the Nazis when they came in and then went up, went after everybody, right? So perhaps like a cautionary tale against governments uh, like hoarding too much information about about uh, to people about people. Um, there is a question about public key infrastructure for business uh, businesses. Basically, I think this is the question about encryption. Um, I think uh, I guess traditionally when we think about security, again we think about network security. In other words, protecting the perimeter of the infrastructure. Uh, whereas encryption talks about securing the data packets as they move through through the network, right? Um, so I guess maybe if you could explain to I guess a general audience of, of, of people um, how the public and private uh, key infrastructure works for SGID. Yeah, sure. Um, so. Uh... Let's see. Uh, for those of you who don't, who are not familiar with uh, public-private key uh, sort of uh, uh, encryption, the way it works is that um, unlike sort of normal symmetric key encryption, which has you know one key that locks and unlocks the data, uh, in public-private key encryption, there is one key which locks the data but cannot unlock it, and there's another key which unlocks the data but cannot lock it. Uh, and this is a this is like how this is done is a sort of a longer math lecture, but like it's a pretty cool property that you can have. You can have one key that locks it that can't unlock, and one key that can unlock but cannot lock. And this means that if you want to receive this data, you can just easily generate these keys. Like, it, like every computer has the ability to generate a public private key pair. In fact, every time you like connect to the internet or, see, or like go to Facebook or go to Google and you see the little lock on the icon, like it does, it uses public key infrastructure to some degree. Um, and what this means is that you can take a public key and you can share it widely. And it doesn't matter because all that public key does is allow people to encrypt messages to you. It doesn't allow people to, uh, to impersonate you. Um, and this is this is just a fundamental part of how the internet works, um, and um, and with that, that means a business can publish their public key wherever they want. Really, they can put in their QR code, they can put in their website, they can paste it on the wall, like you know whatever. Like it, it's just a it's just a, a way to publicly announce this. Now the question is, how do you know that this is the business's public key as opposed to some random person's public key, right? Uh, and that's where our, and that's where our transaction server comes in, where like we verify that you know this public key is tied to this specific. Uh, to this specific uh, business, and there is a there. I mean, there's this is a much longer discussion how public key infrastructure works, and like you have a root certificate authority, and that signs sub uh, sub authorities to verify sub people, and like so on and so forth. 
uh, but basically you have a root set of people that you trust and then you sign sub keys and sub keys until they, you see and you follow that chain of signatures to verify that this person is indeed who you, who you, who you, who you, who you believe him to be. Um, so it works reasonably well. Um, there have been some there have been some compromises in the history of the internet, uh, but generally speaking, there are multiple root trusts and like yeah. It, so I mean, it's it sounds like I guess if, if I just to sort of use a, a sort of analog uh, analogy, a public key is like my personal address, but a, pri a private key would be like my key to my letterbox that only I can open, something like that. Sort of, uh, yeah. yeah, sort of, except even less sensitive than your personal address. Because your personal address, you may not want to give out everywhere, but your public key is really yeah. like, whatever, just throw right. it on the wall, no one cares. Um, the hard part is associating that public key with that individual identity and the question of right. like, what is a legit business entity, well, that's a bureaucratic question, bureaucratic question more than anything else. Like you want to make right. sure that like, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're sharing something like McDonald's, it is probably like yeah. the McDonald's that you think, not like some random guy whose name is McDonald and trying to steal your data. Um, right, yeah. McDonald's a restaurant, I suppose the McDonald's who has the farm, for yes. example. Yes, <laughs> uh, we only have like four minutes more. I wanted to ask you to, if you had any last thoughts about SGID or, or in fact digital identity in general that you think it's really important for people to take away. Yeah, um, so let me see what I, where I start with this. Okay, so I think the first thing is that we need verified identities online. The, the, the problem, the dysfunction, if you actually trace the dysfunction of most of our online lives, it comes down to not having verified identity. Um, mm. The reason people can scam, the reason people can uh, can post like bad reviews, uh, nonsense reviews without like, you know, or, 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 and, the, and the reason why we have like fake good reviews is because yeah. there is like it all, bought, like you can look at these individual problems and you can try to solve them the best that you can. And the companies really do a lot of work with AI and like identification and screening tragedies. But at the base level, the reason why this doesn't happen in physical reality is because we have one person per person um, and if you're one person per person, then a lot of things can be done because then you can accumulate reputation, you can be accountable, and things work. If you don't have that, then everything goes out, goes out the window. Um, and you seeing how, and this is not just scams, but you're seeing how like it raised the bot farms, randomly upvote things, and like change public perception on nonsense. Uh, like, and it's not, and if it was actual public perception, that's fine. But it's, right. there, it may just be one guy with like you know a few thousand dollars to spend on buying on buying on buying lights. Um, mm -hmm. Same for scams. So I, so I think that is something that we need to have. You cannot have a sane online community without verified identity. You just can't. And people are working around this in various other ways. Um, and so having a government provide, and the only source of provision for verified identity, which ties your online life to a real life, is governments. Like, unfortunately, that is the case. Like, you could imagine some other theoretical third party entity, but for purposes, it has to be government. The question is then, yes, how do we get around these privacy things? And I think the thing that people need to, uh, to think that people can realize is that, like, Technology, by definition, is about letting us do things that we couldn't do before. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, something that's gone, that goes over a lot of our policy considerations, where we think technology is about, oh, we do it on paper and then we do it on a computer because pressing keyboards is nice. Um, no, like, fundamentally, technology is about enabling us, to, like, giving us new levers that we did not have before. And as yeah. you can see, on some of these protocols and these designs, there are things that pe people previously thought impossible, like running a central ID system while maintaining privacy. Yep. It is non-trivial and there are other vulnerabilities still and it's not a panacea, but it is possible. And I think, and like looking into these new technologies, um, not as a like blockchain or cloud, but, as in, but specific, like yep. how does the protocol work and does it solve our issue? Um, I think you can, I think people are surprised about how much of this you can actually do. And there's a lot of thought into this. Like, yep. you know, and again, have to thank cryptocurrencies for this because previously privacy was this thing that <laughs> Sort of looked at here and there, but once cryptocurrencies took off, then suddenly there's like literally billions of dollars in people trying to figure out new privacy protocols uh, and security right. protocols, and that's great. Um, currencies aside, um, yeah. and yeah, and third, yeah. For, for this SGID thing, like I think, I think this is this is this is like this is fundamental stuff. Um, yeah. We need we need to be able like if you think about all the things you want to do in the future, talk about digit like a sort of digital like a, a wonderful digital utopia, right? You yeah. want. Uh, you want people to be able to share the information freely, but you want anonymity. You want to be able to, you don't, you want to avoid scams. You want to make sure that you can just like go to a hospital and have your records be pulled up straight away and like have you diagnosed in a, in a, in a jiffy without, um, but still having all this benefit. You want to be able to, you know, like, you know, let's say, let's say you're, let's say you're applying for a job. You want to be able to quickly send your verified information and not spend all your time. Like, like this all rests on having a digital ID system. And if we don't get this right, yeah. um, then it's very hard to make progress. So yeah, I, I hope that I hope that makes sense. 
No, it totally makes sense. I mean, if you think about it, if, even in the, in the political sphere, right, the people who are most disenfranchised in society are the people who don't have proper identity documents in the first place, right? Um, yeah, and I like how this talk on SGIDs helps how, 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 us think about how technology can make socially real the things that are going on on the internet when it comes to identity, whether it's reputation or accountability or privacy, safety, or attributes or security and authentication. Um, thanks so much, Hongyi, for sort of spending the hour with us for, for, for um, telling us more about uh, SGID. And I hope that this is going to be the first of many, many other talks where people within government talk about the, the ideas that they're, that, they're, that, they're, uh, that they're having, engaging with the public. And I, I just think that, that from just crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing the questions and getting you guys to, sort of t um, to, to ask these questions, we sort of you know, get a, a sort of stronger engagement about, about where we should be going as a society and as Singaporeans. Before you leave, sorry, go ahead. Did you want to say something? No, no. Um, I just want to say thanks. That, like, sorry, like I know there are a lot of questions, and uh, especially yeah. a lot of questions on the protocol and like how it like ensures identity and like anonymity and like whether it's traceable in this way or that way. Like, yeah. Um, apologies, I can't get to all of them. Um, we have fought through it as far as we could, and I, this is, and what we shared is like a very very simplified view. But like, yeah, if if you're uh, uh, you're interested, uh, we can share the slides later. Um, and like, do feel free to just like you know, there's you can you can check it out at id.gov.sg. Um, we try to share, share what we can. If you want, just drop me an email. Uh, we try to, we try to, dis we can go into more detail at a different session at some point if anyone's interested. Um, That'd be great if we could. Yes, yeah, so we can even go into like specific issues in SGID for, in, over over many many sessions if if Hong or his team will will, will let us. Okay, before you guys leave, uh, there is a feedback form. We'd like to get your your your, your feedback about how the session went, what we can do differently in the future. Uh, what other topics we can we can we can uh, we can we, we can approach and then maybe crowdsource some of these good ideas and, and think about other issues we can we can sort of share on. Uh, yeah, with that, thanks everyone and thanks Hongi for 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 uh, spending time with us. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, Thank you. You guys found this useful. Bye. Bye.